So we leave our uh, abode with Circe and make our way out into the wider world. Uh, she's given us instructions. We're going to be careful to bury Elpinor, of course, because of what we learn in the uh, uh, in the underworld. And we're also going to watch out for what we see when we run into the Sirens and the Scylla and the Charybdis. Uh, and we're going to be careful when we run into the Cattle of the Sun. All of these things are information that Odysseus has gathered. Uh, it's making him a little bit better able to be prepared for, be ready to react to uh, the stuff that he runs into. Uh, Sirens, of course, a, a wonderful uh, short episode that gives us uh, a start in this next uh, sequence of stories um, in this uh, very famous uh, phase representation uh, from the British Museum. Thanks, British Museum, for the use of this. Uh, we've paid copyrights to all kinds of people for this, and some were easier to get than others. We're very glad to be able to have this image in the, uh, in the course. It's a wonderful image with Odysseus there. You can see him strapped to his mast. Uh, his men are busy rowing, uh, uh, impervious to the beautiful sounds that are coming at them uh, from uh, these figures that this artist has uh, chosen to represent uh, as uh, being in position on either side of the vessel, and then one swooping down right, with the feathers galore right next to Odysseus. Uh, and you can see him having this uh, amazing sense of being glued to his mast, uh, but still uh, some kind of uh, craning uh, that he's doing toward this beautiful sound. So what do those sirens sing? Well, in fact, Homer tells us. And why don't we just take a quick minute and see what it is that is the siren song. Here's what they say. Come closer, famous Odysseus, Achaea's pride and glory. Moor your ship on our coast so you can hear our song. Never has any sailor passed our shores in his black craft until he has heard the honeyed voices pouring from our lips. And once he hears to his heart's content, sails on, a wiser man. We know all the pains that the Greeks and Trojans once endured on the spreading plain of Troy when the gods willed it so. All that comes to pass on the fertile, fertile earth we know it all. So the sirens know everything. Odysseus is now listening to this uh, melodious song where presumably everything is being sung to him. So this man who's so thirsty for knowledge, uh, who is uh, always uh, seeking out things that are strange, new, uh, restless in his curiosity, uh, has now presumably achieved in hearing the siren song, knowledge of it all. Uh, wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, no one else heard such a thing. We can't verify that Odysseus does indeed know it all, um, but he did indeed figure out a way to hear the siren's song. Uh, next stop, they have to make uh, a, uh, uh, somehow thread the needle between two awful things, the, sire, uh, the Scylla and Charybdis, uh, here, the Scylla is uh, represented, uh, as Homer talks about, a, a monstrous woman uh, with uh, horrible mouths in this kind of snake-like underneath uh, that uh, these horrible mouths go and they can jump on the men. They're hungry for them. Uh, now, Odysseus, in making his way through the Scylla and the Charybdis, he has some uh, uh, advice that he relies on uh, from Circe, but uh, he also faces uh, this kind of awful situation. There's no way he's going to get through here without losing some people. Uh, if he goes too close to Charybdis, he's going to lose all his men. So he decides to do the opposite and get a little too close to the Scylla. And when he gets too close to the Scylla, he knows he's going to lose some men. Uh, this is leading us to universal law number four in the class, which is that Usually, making leadership decisions means choosing between two bad things. Usually, making leadership decisions means choosing between two bad things. And when a person is put into a position of leadership, they have to make those calls. Now, you can, you can see that there's uh, logic to what Odysseus has decided to do, but in being the decider here, he is the one uh, who decides that some of his men are going to die and they get eaten uh, by this uh, uh, creature right here. Uh, awful kind of thing he has to run into. So uh, Odysseus now having known all things, having made the tough call that is required for him to get his ship through, uh, intact through these awful, uh, two awful things, runs into his uh, final adventure, uh, his cattle of the sun. 
Um, he is told to steer clear of this. Uh, they want to make sure that they uh, stay away from this awful uh, potential problem. Uh, but uh, Odysseus's men prevail, uh, and they land on the cattle of the sun. When the winds blow in the wrong direction, uh, they're stuck. And they're stuck without food. Now, we need to look a little bit about cattle and the role they played in ancient Greece. Um, the first thing we should talk about is sacrifice. Uh, cattle are what we do when we want to give a gift to the gods. Uh, cattle are the most luscious and most uh, uh, appropriate kind of gift a person can uh, give. And therefore, they're the thing that you and I as human beings can muster uh, that is grand enough uh, to be a gift to the gods. Uh, Greeks sacrifice other things too if they're less prominent, if they're less wealthy. Uh, it's perfectly fine to sacrifice a pig to the gods or a chicken or whatever you have around. They don't usually sacrifice fish, uh, but they do sacrifice these uh, uh, normal kind of eating animals. Uh, after the god gets a sacrifice, human beings usually partake of, of the killed animal and eat the flesh. Um, and uh, that's understood as a kind of shared meal with the god. Uh, the gods usually only want just the smoke and a few other things we'll learn about this when we read uh, some pieces of Hesiod and the Prometheus story. Um, but uh, mostly what they want is the smoke and then you and I eat the meat. Well, if you're a really wealthy person, the most appropriate sacrifice you can give uh, is the, you, you, you're going to be able to afford the most appropriate sacrifice, which is cattle. A gods love cow meat. Uh, and that's something that the Greeks uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how to get more of. They were, in fact, in certain ways, uh, almost obsessed with this uh, little creature down here. Um, they were fascinated by cows, cattle, oxen, uh, and they, uh, we, we find these representations uh, of cattle in prominent places. Uh, in the artistic record, um, we see, uh, for example, uh, uh, these uh, beautiful golden cups uh, that were recovered at the site of Vafio um, in southern Greece. Uh, they're representative of a very old time. The cups probably date from around 1500 BCE. In other words, well into, uh, you know, well into the past, far enough to be in the time that Homer's representing, and even earlier than that. Uh, we see examples in artistic representations from this time, examples in these Vafio cups, uh, and then also uh, on the island of Crete, um, and in other archaeological finds from the Mycenaean Minoan period, uh, in other words, a sort of high heroic age, uh, where uh, bulls are th this kind of central uh, uh, subject matter for the most lavish, beautiful artistic representations we can find. Uh, this is true in um, uh, frescoes, in wall paintings, and here in these uh, amazing uh, gold cups made of gold. So already a luxury item. What's the appropriate decoration for a luxury item? A similarly uh, luxurious uh, mode of food here doing wonderful dances around, uh, impaling uh, poor human beings at the time they're doing it. But the, the, the uh, interest um, in these cattle as shown uh, through these artistic representation was almost uh, borders on a kind of obsession. Now, uh, there's a further discussion to be had about the social uh, and cultural role of meat. We talked a little bit about its religious significance uh, and a little about uh, its artistic uh, representations, uh, but also in its social and cultural dimension. Uh, meat, uh, especially cattle meat, is extremely important. Uh, eating beef is a, a, an experience, uh, for those who have had it, of r overwhelmingly rich protein. Uh, there's just no question that what is uh, being ingested into a body that's eating meat uh, is, is scratching some kind of an itch. Now, uh, vegetarians and those that, uh, for whatever reasons, don't eat meat uh, may uh, poo-poo this, uh, and yet uh, there's enough uh, uh, anecdotal evidence out there of uh, the kind of rapturous uh, uh, effect that the eating of high-protein food uh, uh, in, uh, does to people for us to recognize that having a strongly super hyper protein rich uh, food source uh, is something that uh, uh, that humans uh, sometimes find, uh, at least sometimes find thrilling. Uh, beef is a, the extreme, the most expensive form of this super rich protein to be found in antiquity. Only the most aristocratic and most wealthy people could have afforded it. It was the luxury food item. Remember what happens when Telemachus goes to see 
uh, nester, and there's this demonstration of wealth. How is that wealth demonstrated when we first arrive on the shore? 81 bulls are being sacrificed. Uh, that's an extraordinarily conspicuous uh, uh, consumption of meat. Um, now, in addition to uh, talking about just the meat itself and maybe the experience of, of eating it, um, we should also make reference to what it takes to raise cattle. Um, most ancient uh, uh, temple sites where cattle are being slaughtered in a kind of regular way also needed to control huge lands around them in order to raise the meat that they needed uh, to sacrifice at the temple site. For example, the, example, the uh, famous temple site at Delphi required control of 13 square kilometers in order to provide enough grazing land uh, for the cattle that they needed to raise to slaughter at that uh, temple site. So in, just in order to have cattle, a person needs to have control of land. Uh, this is not uh, true of every single food source, uh, but it is definitely true of cattle. Uh, so another impediment to just running into this uh, in, in a usual way with any uh, person that you might run into on the street is the land required to do it. It is something that is uh, specifically for very wealthy people. Now, uh, when we do run into then this source of uh, extremely attractive protein on the cattle, the island of the cattle in the sun, we might ask ourselves, uh, well, my goodness, these poor starved, starving men. Here are these glistening uh, examples of the most luxurious kind of food Greeks can imagine, and yet these men are prohibited from eating them. Now, why in the world would a god be so cruel uh, to prohibit them from eating this? Uh, who in the world uh, could uh, prevent this kind of thing from happening? Well, there's an important declaration that has been made. Helios has declared that these cattle are sacred to him. When Helios declares that these cattle are sacred to him, he immediately takes them out of being a normal, authorized food source for human beings. When he takes them out of being a normal, authorized food source for being human beings, when Odysseus' men decide to cross that line, what they've done is much more than eat some cows. What they've done is eat something that they've been told by a religious authority counts not as food. They have crossed a very strong and uh, nearly indelible line in most all cultural formations uh, between what counts as being something authorized to eat and what is something that is not authorized to eat. When they do that, they've committed a very grave crime indeed. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the details of what this crime is all about uh, in a coming uh, next segment.